playing. Uh, we welcome you today to our Sunday service. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to Connie for her beautiful play that she does for us all the time. And I think she deserves a round of applause. So, yeah. As I told Connie, I was thinking if I just stayed seated over there, she'd just keep playing and playing and playing. Uh, <clears throat> I have some other announcements today. I uh, would like to uh, have you share some special prayers for this coming week for Maddie Manley and her family. Brock and Care will be with her in Kansas City as she undergoes some testing. Uh, may our prayer for prayful uh, concern, comfort, and strengthen their family during this journey. Our prayer list also includes Ray's dad, Gene Mall, and family, Bud, who's back in the swing bed here in Aurora, and Zandy, who's still at Riverside in GI. Uh, these, along with all listed in your bulletin, are ones that we all need to remember in our prayer. Uh, our sisters at the First Christian Church have invited the women from our church to a salad supper on September 8th. Pat Pickering is catering a full box lunch. It's a sandwich and fruit skewers and cake balls. And then they're providing the chips and the drinks. And I Sounds like it should be a very fun time. I think we can reciprocate in October. Cool. With an activity. Cool. Uh, so if you've made your reservations, great. If you haven't, uh, I understand there's still time. Uh, if you'll let either Pat know or Jean Sanderson, and I don't know if her phone number is in the bulletin. It is. Is it? Yep. Uh, you can give Jean a call, and they'll be glad to have you come enjoy some a special program they've got lined up uh, on quilting, I believe it is. Uh, so a good time for some joint fellowship between the two churches. That's always helpful. The mission emphasis this month is the backpack program. We all know very well about this program, so please consider giving to this program this month. Uh, you can also help by bringing canned peaches to the church. Uh, the children are back in school, and this program provides extra nutritious foods on Fridays to carry them through the weekends. Uh, plus, your any donations are obviously uh, always appreciated. Uh, lastly, on my list, this came in the mail about the Goodwill uh, Donation Drive is coming to Aurora at the Methodist Church uh, beginning on Tuesday, September 1st at noon through Tuesday, September 8th, um, or until the trailer's full. So if you have, and they'll take anything, sisters, if you want to give up a sister. Uh, so if you have, if you're looking for a fall cleaning, this would be a good time to get rid of some stuff and give it to Goodwill, and uh, they would be most appreciative. Are they? Yes. Wow. Go, go. Those of you who were here in the church some time ago will remember Orville and Beth Coles. They were members of our congregation. Jane and Lou Ann were, were members. They were confirmed in, in um, our, our church. Jane was a classmate of Shelley, and Lou was a classmate of Kirk. And they were here um, from 70, excuse me, I had it, so I didn't have to look it up. Mm -hmm. They lived here from, from uh, 76, and in 89 they moved to Grand Island, and, and Orville passed after that. But, but uh, Beth just passed away a couple weeks ago. Uh, in Minnesota, she was living in a home, rest, nursing home near Jane, and uh, their gra her graveside service was yesterday in Grand Island at the plot where Orville was. And Jim and I went over and saw the kids and the girls and joined. It was just the girls and Jane's husband and, and one of her sons. Mm -hmm. But it was nice to see them, and we uh, just thought I'd let people know if you remembered Beth and, and her family. Very good. 
Other notes, comments, prayers, yes? <clears throat> so next week, I am going to be gone for continuing ed, and you're going to be blessed to have Barb fill the pulpit at both places. Next week will be the last week that we're going to be in church. After that, we are going to go over on the East Walk again, and we will be doing outdoor service uh, until I guess somebody kicks me off the trailer or until the weather doesn't <laughs> cooperate. So we have a lot of people I've talked to that would come to the outdoor service that can't really, don't feel comfortable coming inside the church building. So we decided we're going to go at 10. <clears throat> I know we were at 10.30 before and that was a little later. So we're going to do 10 o'clock. So come with your uh, communion in your cars. The nice thing is we're a little more open now. So if you want to stay in your cars, you can turn on the radio. Or if you want to bring your lawn chairs and sit outside in front of your cars, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So, pass the word around. 10 o'clock, starting the 6th of September. Any other announcements, stories, or concerns? Seeing none, we'll begin. So, if you'll assume an attitude of prayer, we'll begin. Loving God, call us together as your people. Transform us with your love. Transform our hearts that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we may see your grace. Transform our hands that we may serve others. Transform our spirits that we, we may be the body of Christ gathered to worship and sent out to serve. Amen. Our opening hymn... Uh, surely the presence of the Lord. And we're going to sing that twice. Ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. <clears throat> 
Our next hymn is How Great Thou Art. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3. They're again on the screen. Instead of working to sustain community, we follow our own desires. Instead of trusting in your care, we think we can do it alone. Forgive our neglect of others. Give us obedient spirits that we may care for one another, depend on your love, and use our gifts for your gospel. Amen. And now our prayer to confession. Abba Father, who art in heaven, we ask that you would cleanse us of our sins, make us white as snow, give us strength to refuse the temptations of this world, and to die to the flesh's desires. Give us grace and courage to boldly proclaim the saving grace of your Son's blood, and let us hide in the shelter of your wings as a storm rages around us. Amen. The Lord is on our side, offering words of forgiveness, protecting us from danger. We are a forgiven people, bound together in God's love. We are the body of Christ, forgiven and free.
sleep. Mike, can I get you to shut the lights off for me? If you promise you won't go to sleep, can I, can I get the promise? Can we shut the lights off? Well, the scripture today, so we were looking at Esther. And today we're going to finish up with Esther. Uh, most people don't know that there's more to the story. They usually just end it kind of where we did last week. But there's about three more chapters. But there's also a parallel and a mirror between Esther and the book of Romans that we're going to dive into today. So we're going to look at two verses from Romans. This is the scriptures from Romans 5, 1 through 11, and Romans 8, 12 through 17. And I went ahead and I put everything up on the screen this week, because I know some people are more of a visual learner. So you can follow along if you want, or you can just listen. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord, I'm sorry, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And from chapter 8, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not of flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in the order that we may also share in his glory. Thanks be to God. So the book of Esther Esther is us, the mayor. Now, I know we have some people here today that haven't been up on through all those weeks that we've been doing Esther. Um, so I'm going to just do a little bit of a background. We're just going to do a quick little synopsis of the whole story. So that way, maybe it'll even be a rejog. So when we dive into Romans, you'll start seeing the connection. So the recap is, as we said, this was during the time that there was a Jewish remnant that stayed behind in Persia. It was after the deportation. And King Cyrus of Persia had taken over and he allowed the Jews to go back home. Now what did they do? They started rebuilding King Solomon's temple. So when you hear about the second temple, that was the one. Now, the new king of Persia at the time was King Xerxes, and he married Queen Vashadi, which was King Nebuchadnezzar's granddaughter, and she becomes pregnant. Now, the king wanted to show her off, or as I said, I think more he wanted to show off what was inside, the heir to the throne. And she refused during the drunken, drunken brawl, and so that broken edict, I should say that well, it didn't break an edict. She just refused, and that was breaking the law. And so the wise men said that they wanted an edict made that Queen Vishadi would be dethroned so that all the other women would not follow suit and disrespect their husbands. And they also banished her, even from the king, which made another problem. He needed a new queen. 
So that's where we jumped in last week. And we found that there was a young, young Jewish girl by the name of Hadassah. She was adopted by her cousin Mordecai. Now, for fear of their nationality being Jews, he changes her name to a strong Persian name so nobody will know that she's Jewish, and he names her Esther. And as we saw, Esther literally means that which is hidden. And there are so many hidden things in this book that is so much fun. It's like an onion. You peel back the layers and you find more and more. I really wish we could have done about a 14-week Bible study on this, but maybe another time. Now, the name of God is never mentioned in this Bible. That's another, in this book, that's another hidden thing. However, God's thumbprint is on everything. And if you even get into some of the coding, you find that his name really is mentioned, along with Yeshua, five to nine times within the story. So God is not hidden at all. And the book is full of coincidences, or I would say God incidences. Because God is orchestrating all the events. Now, there was a man by the name of Shemini that David showed grace to instead of killing him. And he has a grandson who is Mordecai. And Mordecai ends up being King Xerxes' gatekeeper. Hence why he was some of the remnant that didn't go back. He had a very prestigious job and he liked it in Persia. And so God is radiating through his cousin Hadassah. And everybody knows that she's humble, she's pure, she's lovely, for the inside out. And she even takes the king's eye, and so he picks her to be the new queen of Persia, against her better judgment, but that is now where God is using her. So we come now to our villain in the story. If you remember, how many here would know what you're supposed to do when you hear the word Haman? Mm -hmm. Boo, that's right. Good Orthodox Jews, every time Haman's name is mentioned, you're supposed to hiss, boo, and spit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest spitting, but... He is named five times in the book of Esther as the enemy of the Jews. We know why. Because of Saul's disobedience, and he didn't kill King Agag, and he let his son go, that then that history comes down the generations. He's the last of the Agites, and that is where Amon finds himself. He is literally, he and his ten sons are the very last of the Agite tribe. And um, his whole purpose is revenge. And he wants the extinguishing of the Jews. So this is where we see, we come to our time. Haman has become the right-hand man to the king. He has all the power. He is second in command. And he has, well, he has all the, the I think my battery is going in. Well, he has all of the um, power and the wealth and the everything, prestige, everything you could want. There's one thing he can't get, and that's the respect of Mordecai. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. And this just infuriates him. So Haman decides he's going to kill Mordecai. But then when he finds out who Mordecai is, that he's a Jew, yep, my battery's going to, that he is a Jew, Haman decides to devise a plan to wipe out all the Jews once and for all. Now he's a very suspicious man and he starts casting lots. So if you've heard of the word of Purim, that's a holiday that the Jews still um, celebrate to this day. It's memorating this right now. He casts Lot to find out when the day is that he's going to exterminate him. And it happens to land on a year from this time. So he goes to the king with his plot. And he tells him that there's evil people plotting evil things behind the king's back. They must be dealt with and totally eradicated. Now this is the catch. King Xerxes, without paying any attention, knowing any of the facts, he doesn't know who they are or what they've done, he gives Haman his singlet ring, which is like an open checkbook, and he says, do it as you wish. Well, that sealed their fate. And as we know, once an edict is in, even the king cannot change it. So when all this gets reported, I mean, Mordecai knows about it, he goes back to Esther, and Esther says, I can't go before the king, I'll die. Mordecai shows his faith because he tells her this very thing. He says, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your families, father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. The most famous line that's probably still quoted to this day. 
So Esther, this is where she goes back and she tells them, okay, we're going to fast and we're going to pray for three days and three nights. And this is going to become crucial when we get into Romans. If you notice in the Old Testament, there's a lot of three days and three nights leading up to Jesus in the tomb. And then when this was done, she says, I will go to the king, and even though it's against the law, if I perish, I perish. So that's where we find her now. She's getting ready to go before the king. And it says she adorns herself in royal robes. That's going to be another key. I'm giving you clues along the way. <coughs> so she goes to the king in her royal robes, and he extends out the golden scepter so we can breathe a sigh of relief. She does not die. But she doesn't have the guts to tell the king what it is she really wants. So she invites him to a banquet. Have you ever had a time in your life where you knew you needed to do something and it just didn't feel right? The timing was just all off, even though you wanted to and you knew you should. Well, that's usually a God thing. Because God is still putting the pieces down and he's orchestrating this all together. So she says, uh, if it pleases the king, I want to invite you and Haman to a banquet that I prepared. That sounds like a good thing. So they go to the banquet. And Haman comes out of that banquet so full of himself, he's so excited, he's just been honored with something that no other man has had. A meal with both the queen and the king. And as he's going home, he goes by Mordecai, <laughs> who refuses to bow down to him. And all of that excitement, all of that pride, just, he gets so mad. He's in such a rage, he goes home, his wife and his friends tell him, just get rid of Mordecai, kill him. So that's what he does. He builds a gallows, 75 feet tall, to put Mordecai on. Now, as I said, gallows and a sense hung is not really what it was back then. It was really a pole that they paled on, which was really the first crucifixion. That's going to become another key. Started with the, Greek, with the Persians and went to the Greeks and then to the Romans. So this is what he's thinking about. He's going to go to the king first thing in the morning to ask him if he can execute Mordecai. Now, I want you to realize, if you didn't catch this last week, that the entire fate of the Jewish nation rests on one night that the king can't sleep. Because he goes home and he cannot sleep after that banquet. So he brings in the scribe, and that was pretty protocol. When the king couldn't sleep, they would start reading from the annals. The scribes would follow him all day long, and they would take basically a diary. And you got to love God. Of all the days that the scribe picks to read from, it wasn't counting sheep or the amount of harvest they took in. It was from five years ago when a certain man by the name of Mordecai saved the king from an assassination plot. The king perks up his ears, and he goes, Ah! I remember that. But it doesn't say. He says, what, what reward was given to Mordecai? Well, the scribe says, nothing. <laughs> it was a clerical error. But it wasn't. It was in God's timing. So he's thinking about all this. We've got to do something. We've got to reward him. And about the time he hears footsteps downstairs in the, in the palace courtyard, and he said, who's there? And he says, it's Haman. And Haman comes in ready to say, I want to execute Mordecai. And the king says, wait a minute, wait a minute. i got something for you. He says, what would you do? You're good with ideas. What would you come up with as a plan to honor somebody that the king delights in? Oh, Haman gets so puffed up. He's thinking all these wonderful things. Well, there's nobody that the king likes better than me. So he says, oh, you need to give him one of your royal robes and put him on your royal horse. And yeah, you know what? Let's give him a parade and then make one of the princes lead him through the parade, hollering, this is what happens to the man that the king delights in. <laughs> and then the king says, you know what? That's great. Go at once and do everything you just said. Don't admit anything, but do it for the good Jew Mordecai. <laughs> I don't think there's any better literature or story written that shows the most irony is that right there. So Haman has to lead the very man he wants to kill through the streets in a parade on royal horse and royal robes, hollering, this is what happens to the man in which the king delights. And when he gets done, he can't even continue to sulk and be mad because the king's attendants come and whisk him away to the banquet of banquets. As I said the night before, Esther couldn't bring herself again to tell the king, so she asked him for one more night. 
One more banquet. See, God needed that 24 hours. There was a reason why he made her wait. Because during that 24 hours, instead of Haman being elevated and Mordecai being killed, the tables are reversed, and now Mordecai has been elevated, and Haman is about to get what he deserves. And it's during this time that the king, his curiosity is so piqued, and he says, what is it that you want? What can I do for you? And if you notice how she always starts it, she says, humbly, if it pleases the king, would you spare my people? This is my request. For my and my people have been sold to be destroyed, to kill, annihilated. If we were merely sold to be slaves, I would have kept quiet. But because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. See, she's still telling him. She's still buttering him up. If I was even being sold out from underneath you to be your slave, I wouldn't have said anything. But we're sold to be killed. And the king, all of a sudden, he's, he's kind of remembering, oh yeah, there was an edict about some people, but he realizes he never asked any questions. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, the guy I just gave a parade for? <laughs> and now my queen? Who did this? See, he's not taking the responsibility on himself. Who did this? And she says, the adversary, the enemy, this vile Haman. Boo. <laughs> Maybe it gets... And all of a sudden he realizes, and as the king is furious, his men behind him put her, a towel over Haman's face, and then it is his eunuchs that says, hey, you know what? There's already a pole, a 75 foot pole outside of Haman's house. He was going to kill the good Jew Mordecai on it. <laughs> the king says, hang him on. What a flip of events. 24 hours. Just 24 hours. So that's where everybody usually leaves it. The happily after ever. The wonderful ending. But that's far from the end of the story. Because there's still an edict. We forget about that. Remember the one that was put into place that said all the Jews were to be destroyed in one year? Well, four months goes by, and Esther goes before the king a second time. We don't talk about that either. The first time, she risked going for death to go before him unannounced. This happens again. She's not invited the second time, but she adorns her royal robes, and she goes before the king humbly, and he extends the royal scepter to her again. And she tells him, there's still this edict. My life and my people's lives are still at stake. He's basically begging him to fix it. Well, of course he can't get rid of the edict. So he looks at Mordecai, who now has taken Haman's job. He is now the right-hand man, the second most powerful man in Persia. And he has been given the king's sign, the signet ring, which means anything that he has that ring, he's got the blank checkbook. And the king says, you have my ring. Do what you need to do. So Mordecai makes a new edict that says that the Jews have full authority to prepare and to fight when the attack comes. And whoever they conquer, they get to keep the plunder. Now this includes 127 provinces. This is not just in Persia. This goes all the way over to East by Asia. It goes clear down to Egypt and Africa, all the way up north to Israel. So think about this. The people that had left from King Cyrus, they went back, they're building the temple. This includes them. They would all be eradicated. So it goes out in all these different languages. So as the time draws near, it says many converted to Judaism. <laughs> you don't love that, right? Now maybe it was just for self-preservation. I mean, they had seen what all God had done for the Jews, so they're jumping on board. Maybe some jumped on board because they agreed, because they knew whoever we conquer, we get to keep their stuff. And maybe some actually converted to Yahweh. Even the king's army fought alongside of the Jews. The very people that were supposed to kill them have now joined them. So see, with God, they won easily, and they had peace in the land. So Esther saves the people, in a sense, kind of twice. 
By risking everything to alert the king the first time and then risking death again to bleed, bleed for a way to save her people. Now, as I said last week, Xerxes is actually assassinated three years after this happens. Uh, Mordecai had thwarted a detent before, but this time uh, he does die. And after he dies, his son, that I said Queen Vishali was pregnant with, he becomes the heir to the throne. And he reinstates his mother as queen. And we see that Esther falls into the backdrop, which is probably where she wanted it to be. God had used her for that time, for that purpose. And now she probably leads a life of peace. We don't really know too much about Esther after that happens. But my question to you is, where do you see yourselves in the story? What character did you relate to the most? Now the next question is, how does the story do you see playing into the whole role of the words that Paul wrote in Romans? We're going to look at verse 5 again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace, that which we now can stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Did you notice Mordecai? What a faith. From the very beginning, he had faith. When he even goes to Esther, he says, deliverance will come from some other place. He's remembering the words of Abraham that God had given him. Through you, I will make a great nation. I will sustain the nation. Through Moses, he knew of the covenant. So he had that faith. And he had a peace deep down in God. That's where he boasts, in the hope of the glory of God. See, David, as we saw, he showed grace the first time to Shemana. And Mordecai shows the faith and then that perseverance. And Esther is really us, isn't she? When we're obedient anyway. <laughs> she was obedient. She trusted in God, not in herself. She didn't just say, well, I'll go see the king. No, what did she do? She took that time to fast and to pray, and not just herself. She said, all of my, har my harem will do that, all my attendants, and I want you to go and get all the Jews to fast and pray for three days and three nights. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for what? Three days and three nights. When Jesus is with his disciples, before he's ready to be crucified, he brings up the story of Jonah, and he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for what? Three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man. There's another key thing. When the time came for her to go before the king, this is after she's fasted, she sat on sackcloth and ashes. It says she dressed in her finest royal robes. She didn't go moping in front of the king. Oh, woe is me. No. It said she cleaned herself up and she presented herself in her finest. She knew what the protocol was to go before the king. She came humbly in reverence before him. She had already died to herself to offer herself up as a living sacrifice if needed. So do you see the symbolism here? I've talked a little bit about the church being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom. We're going to look more into that down the road in the next maybe few weeks and months. But as the bride, do you go to your wedding in your t-shirt, your shorts, or your painting clothes, or your gardening clothes? No, you put on your finest, you adorn yourself in your royal robes to be presented before the king. And you typically, if you're going to have a happy marriage, you don't come walking down the aisle going, ain't I all that and aren't you glad to have me? You come humble before your spouse to be, right? Grateful in gratitude that they have chosen you. And that's what Esther does. Verse 3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know suffering produces what? Perseverance. They know suffering, but it makes you persevere. I want you to think about times in your life, the times where you have suffered, the times that have been really big trials. Did it make you stronger? 
Or did you just hide in the corner and never face life again? Because it says if you persevere, if you dig within and you cling to God with that faith, it builds what? Character. And I think Esther is the perfect display of character. Boshi and Mordecai. And that character produces what? Hope. And who's the hope in? Not in ourselves. Our hope is in God, in Christ. And hope does not put us to shame, but because God's love has been poured out into every heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Don't you love that? That's the hope that God's love is poured out. That's the promise into each and every one of your hearts. We see that she's willing to risk on everything. She's been refined through fire. That's what trials do. And it matures us. Have you ever asked God for patience? Don't, unless you want Him to put you through something that will require you to learn patience. If you ask God that you want to be more faithful, be careful, because He's going to put you in situations that's going to require you to have to learn how to become more faithful. It's those kinds of things in our lives that mature us, that mature our faith, our hope, and our trust. Because now we have a solid foundation. Now we've dug through those scriptures and we've learned those stories and we've learned those principles so we can hang our hat on it. We know what we're trusting in and where our hope is. I love verse 6. Did you catch that? You see, just at the right time, <laughs> when you were still powerless, that's Esther, right? She had no power whatsoever. She was queen, but she was still risking death. She had no power on her own. But when it was in God's right time, it says Christ died for the ungodly. Remember the, after the story that I said when they, they were given the edict they could fight them for themselves and they said all these Gentiles started converting to Judaism. See, God just didn't die. It wasn't just here for the Jews. He's for all of us, for all the Gentiles throughout the world. He died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Each and every one of us is a sinner. It's only by the glory of God. Only through accepting his son Jesus Christ, his saving salvation, that we can be made whole and be with him in heaven. Now what does Haman represent? He represents the flesh, the lust and the desires of the flesh, the desire to live and love the world and all the treasures, the empty promises it offers. He really represented what greed and hatred and revenge and all that stuff looks like, the ugly heart. And I think we all can relate to Haman a little bit. If you don't, you're probably just lying to yourself because we're all sinners. There's all a shred of pride. We all have a little shred of greed maybe of revenge. When we are not one with Jesus, we lust after all those things in life, right? Those things that are impure, they're ungodly, they're defiling. We're spiritually dead. That's what the scriptures say. And just as Haman was crucified on that pole of his own making, so we are called to crucify our flesh, right? Our desires of the flesh to God. Jesus says, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot enter into the kingdom. So from Romans chapter 8, we get there for brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will what? Die. But if the spirit you put to death, the misdeeds of your body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. And this is great. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to what? Sonship. But you got to love it. Even Esther was what? Adopted by Mordecai. The symbolism? She was wanted. She was brought in. So are we. God wants us so bad. We are adopted. We are grafted into his family. 
He says, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, that in order that we may also share in his glory. See, that's the hope. That's what we peg everything on. That we are made heirs into him, we share in that suffering, and we also share in the glory. So my question to you is, through this whole four weeks, what really resonated the most from the story of Esther for you? If you haven't had a chance to see the past ones, I would highly suggest you go on YouTube, you can go on Cobalt, uh, go back through, and if anything, just watch the, the message. I know there's a lot of information there, a lot of those little hidden things that we found, but what resonated? What new insights did you get? Maybe you've run the parallel with this and the letter that Paul penned to Rome. We said, even though God was not mentioned outright, he's hidden, his name is hidden throughout that story five to nine times. Five times with God, with Yahweh, and actually there's three times that Yeshua, Jesus, is mentioned in the Old Testament. And as we just saw from Romans, right? You see that parallel. It's through Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. God's thumbprint is throughout this whole story. As Mordecai stated, he had faith, deliverance would come in some shape or form, but he was reminding Esther that God had chosen and gifted her the opportunity to play a big part in that role. So in the end, God helped them win. But did you notice something? They had to fight, right? He didn't just make it all go away. It wasn't just the son the king could erase the eating or to say that one doesn't exist. No, they had to fight. They had to be an active participant. They couldn't just sit back and have it handed to them. They had to do their part to fight for freedom. So what is God calling you to do? Do you feel something on your heart through these four weeks working? What is he saying that you need to be a part of? Or is he asking you to actively step out in faith and be led by the Holy Spirit? I can tell you right now that each and every one of you sitting in these pews, that God created you. He puts you right here in the 21st century, at this time in your life, in Aurora, Nebraska, for a reason, for a specific reason. I would ask that you would take some time to ponder that. Figure out what that reason is and what God is asking you to do. Because who knows? He may have placed you right here, right now, for such a time as this. Amen. So we come to our time of prayers. We've lifted up some. I'm going to ask if there are others right now that you've thought of that you want to lift up. If not, if you'd bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and there are many on our hearts and minds that are suffering. Um, they need your healing touch. They need your restoration. We know that there are many that are still struggling due to this pandemic, whether it be from loss of loved ones or maybe illness themselves, or can even just be still reeling from the financial difficulties from the loss of work or the shortcomings from work. We ask that you would be with all the kids and the teachers that are in school and college and just be with them as they're adapting and changing to the new norm. Dear Lord, we thank you for everything that you have showed us through Esther. We thank you for those hidden, hidden uh, nuggets. My prayer is that you would touch each and everyone's heart to dig into the scriptures, to be hunger, to hunger deep within, to want to know more, to learn more, so that way they have a solid foundation. Something that they can, without equivalently, put their faith and their hope and their trust in. And not be afraid to proclaim it to everyone else. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died not just for the godly, but for the ungodly. For each and every one of us. For Jews and Gentiles, for slaves and free. For men, for women. We thank you for that gift. We thank you that... 
He allowed himself to be crucified on that cross. But he didn't stay there. He arose again. He ascended into heaven. And he has bridged the gap and made a way that we can one day too be with you in heaven as well. And we thank you for that gift and the other gift of his prayer that he gave us on those times when we are wrestling in our souls so much that even the words cannot leave our lips. You've given us a prayer that we can pray to you any time and any place. Would you please join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We come to our time of offerings. Again, the plates are in the back. But I would ask you to think of more than just the monetary. God has called us to give of our first fruits. Not just that which he's given us physically, but that which he's given us internally. He's asking us to give of ourselves first to him. Before we expend our energy on everything else. Ask God what it is that he's requiring of you. What he's asking you to give, to sacrifice, that could spread his gospel and his message out the block, down the street, through the community, beyond the state, beyond the nation and the world, about his son's saving grace. Amen. Day by God's saving, amazing grace, I want you to spend this time really thinking about the words as you sing the first and the third verse. <laughs> We love to God on high. The 
that he will keep us safely and guard us with his love. I will not be afraid. I will not run and hide. For there is nothing I shall fear when God is God's people said, Amen. Amen.